before we had a product, we sold the product. So if you've ever heard of an MVP, minimum viable product, or even just before that is like monetize before you make it. So you create the thing in theoreticals. So you say, this is what we're producing, or this is what we're making, or this is the program we're running, or this is the product we're developing. Would you like to pre-purchase it? Welcome to the Her First Podcast. We're all about helping female identifying business owners, coaches, and creators build their dream life by putting themselves in the driver's seat. If you want to transform your business and build the life you want, then make sure to follow our podcast and stay tuned for what's next. Welcome to today's episode of Her First. I'm so excited to introduce to you our very special guest joining us live, well, live for me. Michelle is our guest on today's episode. Welcome, Michelle. I am so excited to be here. Thank you for having me, Joanna. A few weeks ago, we did an interview where Michelle interviewed me about my business, Millennial Marketer, and we thought it would be really fun to turn the tables and interview Michelle about her newish, newish business, maybe a year old. You'll tell us all the real details. To be honest, um, Michelle's seen a lot of success and is growing that business. It's a physical product business, which is a little bit different than what we talk about on a day-to-day basis here, but we wanted to take some time to really dig in, get her story, and learn about To Be Honest. So Michelle, could you just start off by telling us a little bit more about TBH? Yeah. So we started To Be Honest Beverage Company, also known as TBH, about a year ago. So we are technically a year in. That being said, our first year was not specifically about growth. So we didn't just like hit the ground running. Let's do everything. Let's be everywhere. Let's make as many sales as possible. It was really kind of like our beta test market year to figure out whether the product would sell, do a lot of customer discovery, test it out in restaurants and retail and see if it would continue to sell over time without trying to completely saturate the market and then not have the brand awareness or the sales to kind of like back it up. So we're at a point now where we're super excited about the future, which I'll tell you more about as we kind of move through the episode. But for those who don't know, To Be Honest Beverage Company is a non-alcoholic hemp-infused spirit alternative. So ultimately, it replaces the liquor or alcohol in your cocktail. And it, our first inaugural style is designed like a gin. They're meant to mimic traditional spirits so that you can replace you know, the liquor alcohol in your recipe that you're familiar with. So whether that's a G&T, a gin fizz, other botanical based beverages that, you know, mixes really well with berry, citrus, floral, like all those kinds of things. It just blends really nicely in a cocktail. And so a little bit of the background of why I got started. About two and a half years ago, I stopped drinking and that kind of led us down the path of experimentation. And my husband and business partner, Jeremy, has been in alcohol production for the past decade. So over 10 years of craft beer, craft mead, craft cider, and he's always wanted to create a non-alcoholic option. So when I transitioned away from alcohol, that kind of led into this process. We started talking about options. What are we going to do? How are we going to have this like, you know, fit the market and also curate what I needed? And that's where, to be honest, Bev and, you know, our non-alcoholic spirit or kind of hemp infused, CBD infused spirit alternative came from. I love what you're doing because there's so many reasons why people don't drink like alcohol. And even if they don't, they're not fully on the no zero alcohol journey, they might want to be able to go out, enjoy a beverage or at home, enjoy a fun beverage and it just not have alcohol. Um, We've talked about on the show before, I I have an autoimmune issue, so I don't drink a lot. Like I will drink some like occasionally celebratory or go out, but I don't drink a lot because that affects my overall immune system. And so to be able to go out with a friend and grab a drink and it be fun and festive, but not have alcohol in it or even have health benefits of it is really interesting to me as someone who does drink, but doesn't drink a lot intentionally, right? And and having options is so great. And it's so great that you're you're part of that, right? You're experiencing that. You want that thing and you're actually going out and creating it. Not just saying I want the thing, but you're, you're, part of the solution, really. Yeah. And that's been a part of this, what we would call a movement. It's titled Sober Curious. And there are some people who call it like gray area drinking. So it used to be that if you weren't drinking, there was a problem. Otherwise, you just drank. Like there wasn't a lot of like 
oh, I'm not drinking tonight or I'm not drinking for health reasons or I'm just choosing not to drink. It was kind of like you either have a problem or you drink alcohol and it was just very black and white. And so now we have the Sober Curious movement and a larger discussion around really changing your relationship with alcohol. I think I grew up at a time where it was like, it's not about if you start drinking, but when you start drinking. And then alcohol is so ingrained in our culture. It's happy hours, it's celebrations, it's nightly ritual, it's charity functions and events. It's like, it's all across the board. Alcohol permeates the activities, events, the celebrations that we participate in as a culture, as a society. And so when you transition away from alcohol and whether that is tonight, this week, Monday through Friday, the month, or forever, it can look a lot like figuring out what does that new lifestyle look like and how do you fit into your normal drinking culture and how do you find things? Because I always say like when I stopped drinking alcohol, it didn't mean that I want to stop drinking anything. So having, finding alternative beverages, alternative societal, like cultural solutions to what it is that you're doing on a day-to-day basis is really important and really critical. And so we feel like we fit into that and kind of bring a little bit more of a sophisticated, elevated adult experience to it as well. Yeah. It's so interesting how, and this could be like a whole nother discussion, but like when you make lifestyle choices that are like outside of the norm, the, the questions, the curiosity that other people have, my husband doesn't really drink at all. So if we are out with friends like I might have a glass of wine he will likely drink nothing and people notice it and like comment on it oh he there is literally no rhyme or he just doesn't drink it's not even like a conscious he just doesn't like it like it's like not even like a personality thing or or a choice where he's making any sort of statement he just is like mm, not really into it and people will ask or assume things or all of that and it's so interesting to watch people just not quite know what to do with you when you like fall outside of that norm that would be like an interesting we've kind of talked a little bit about that but when you when you live a life that's like off the beaten path that effect that it has on you with the, your integration into the community it'd be like an interesting topic but i want to talk about today your first year of business and maybe some of those milestones that you've hit. What are your big milestones for TBH in its first year? So the things that I'm really proud of, like we haven't had a really big first year. Like we've only done about $25,000 in sales total. And that's direct to consumer, wholesale, restaurant, retail, markets, like events, all of those kinds of things put together. And so when I look at that number over the past year, I actually, you know, going through this process, we're in the process of funding right now. So I'm creating pitch decks for investors, for pitch competitions, applying to grants, like doing all of those things. And when I look at that number, I'm a little disappointed and like, well, why didn't we make more money in the first year? And then I look back and I realize, well, actually, we didn't prioritize that. Our prioritization was around creating a foundational brand that people really connected with that spoke to them. It was about talking to our customers and ideal clients and figuring out how best to target them and how best to support them. Because when you transition away from alcohol, like we're talking about, like it, it's it's more of an identity and a lifestyle than it is anything else. Like we always just say, we say we're not just a product or we're not just a drink, we're a lifestyle shift. And for a lot of people, that can mean vulnerability. It can mean feeling uncomfortable in social settings. It can mean, what do I replace that stress relief with? That nightly ritual that I'm so used to grabbing a drink out of the refrigerator or making a drink before I go to bed. Like There are things that fit into people's lives that we take for granted. And so by creating something that provides you know, the research-backed benefits of CBD while also just filling the habit or the behavior, that's been really important for us. And we've also participated in a lot of like public relations promotions. So getting featured in places like Edible Slow, Proof Magazine, local newspapers, speaking on other podcasts, so other Sober Curious podcasts, just kind of like integrating ourselves into the Sober Curious community and starting to understand this industry, food and drink, beverage, CPG as a whole, was a big milestone from this year, is really seeing the need for it, really seeing that there is a problem out there, really feeling, really feeling and seeing the feedback 
that we have a product that people love and enjoy and that will continue to sell, like that's a huge milestone for us. So not only did we get into restaurants and bars, which you can do as a trial, as an experiment, most brands have the ability to break into a market in that way, but then six, eight months down the road to still be getting purchases to be growing what they're we're supplying and for it to increase on their menu you know instead of one drink now they have two that shows and demonstrates that again there's a need we fit it people love it and they're going to continue to buy it which is huge right like we want to be able to increase the lifetime value of our direct to consumer customers who are going to be repeat purchases but also our restaurants and wholesale options and a lot of CPG companies struggle because they might influx tons of funding make a bunch of sales right up front Front, get into a bunch of retail stores, chains, wholesalers, and locations, but they don't have the brand awareness or the product to support it. And so people don't continue to purchase or they're not aware of it and they don't purchase it right out the gate. And there are a lot of companies, if you go in with them, you have to do a certain number of sales and have a certain level of success within a very short time frame. Otherwise, like you're out and you won't be considered again. So it's a very cutthroat industry. And for us, we didn't want to grow beyond our capacity or grow beyond our growth too early. We really wanted to value validate and just make sure that things were functioning and flowing. And so now we're at a point where we say, yes, we've got the green light. Things are looking good. Okay, we can do this. Now let's expand. Now let's grow. Now let's move exponentially. And so as we're looking at funding projections in 2025, that's going to be huge. And so I'm really proud that we were able to go to the events, that we will, we were able to have these conversations, that we were able to really connect with people on a deeper, deeper level to understand the why, understand their investment in the brand, understand their need for the product, and be able to now turn around and say, okay, now we have a really healthy foundation. And now i I'm going to do what it takes in order to get to that next level, to get to the six figures, to get to the eventual seven figures. And what is that going to take? And that takes strategy. Like it's it's really challenging. Like I've never had to do this in business before, even though I've done it on like a more basic level. But I'm actually chatting with someone today to think about what are our, all of our expenses going to look like? What are all of our potential income going to look like? What channels do we need to push at? What rate? If we hire on these three key full-time individuals, what does that look like for our company? And when you're looking at that from like a, you know, multi six, seven figure level for a CPG physical product business that takes into account brick and mortar, inventory, cost of goods, employment, distribution, like, you know, cost of shipping, boxes, packaging, all the paraphernalia when it comes to like printed goods. It's it's a lot of things. It's not a service-based company. You know, we're not online. We don't have a low overhead with software, you know, when you think about it from that frame of reference. And so it's definitely a new world for me and it's very interesting, but I'm grateful that I've been able to get to this point. And even just the pitches, like being able to put together a pitch deck is not simple. And now I have two. I have an investor specific one and I have a pitch competition specific one. So I'm also very very proud of that milestone. So lots of things to be proud of, even if they're not directly related to like physical sales. You know, we're we're still working on our second batch in terms of selling that. But I think that the potential for exponential growth from here is only in place because of the success of the past year. Yeah. And if you think about it, you know, last year in some ways was a way for you to do live and active market research, right? So you sold things and you were making money with that, but doing that in research. Now, some people with like a consumer good or even a digital product spend a lot of time in market time on market research before actually going to market. And and you basically kind of just did it at the same time in some ways where you got yourself ready to ready to scale and ready to say, okay, now we're ready to go get an investor. Because with like a digital business, you might be able to build it without that investment because you can kind of scale up as you go. This kind of business, like you have to be able to create and have the physical product and then be confident that someone's going to buy it. Because if no one's going to buy it and you spent $50,000 creating, you know, that that product, you're just out $50,000 and you're done. You know, if you haven't done taken the work to do the research and know that people are interested in that product. So, you know, it sounds like you had a really great focused year and are really ready to to ramp up into, you know, 2025 and be that multi seven figure a year business, right? I'm speaking it to it into existence. I'd love to know a little bit about how you create this. What's the process? Who is involved? 
tell me about it. Do you have a warehouse? Like what happens? How do you make the bottle? One bottle. So uh, this is different depending on where you're coming from because you're completely right. Like there are different ways to go about businesses. There are different approaches. And when you look at, like I always say, a business is not a business is not a business. And the more that I understand business, the more that that is like, so freaking true because there are business principles that are important that you can talk about across the board, but it's so different and unique to the industry that you're entering, the niche that you have, the product you're creating, the service that you're delivering. Like it really changes everything and how you want to go about it. Like you have the decision whether you want to bootstrap, you have the decision of private lending, you have the decision of angel funding, you have the decision of venture capital, you have the decision of crowdfunding, like you have the decision of how you approach your business from a financial perspective, as well as like, do you want it to be just you? Are you going to be a solopreneur? Are you going to be the practitioner? Are you going to put all the effort energy in? Do you want a team from the very beginning? Are you going to go into partnership with someone? Are you going to co-found? Like there's so many different ways you can cut the cake and it's important to recognize that you get to choose what that looks like. So for us, we wanted to validate the offer offer. We wanted to validate the offer first. And so you mentioned like there are CPG brands who put a ton of money, like lots of money. I actually was just in a conversation with someone who has a a hemp based like granola business, cracker business, and they've already invested tens of thousands of dollars in the team, in the product creation, in the marketing, in the online website presence, social presence, et cetera. And they haven't sold their product yet because they're working with a co-packing facility. And that's super common in the CPG industry where most people go directly to a company that's already in place. They have the facility, they have the manufacturing, they have everything that they need, where it's, whether it's a beverage or whether it's a food product in order to make it. And so that's one direction. And that's going to take a lot more capital infusion up front. It's going to take working with those people to figure out what that product's going to look like. It's going to take like all of the pieces. For us, because we're kind of in a unique situation, one, we're in a small town. So I feel like that always gives us like a little bit of an upper hand when it comes to bootstrapping and figuring things out. When you're in a city, you have a lot more limited access, like warehousing, product creation. Like it makes more sense to go with co-packing because how are you actually going to facilitate making your product by hand? You could start in a commissary kitchen, which some people do. Like All the Bitter is a really amazing uh, zero-proof bitter company. They started in commissary kitchen. So you rent the space in a commissary kitchen, you make your product, you bring it to market, you test it out. You can only make so many before you actually expand into your own space, your own warehousing, your own distribution. And then again, co-packing if you need something like that. Again, there's a lot of directions you can come at it from a CPG company. For us... We have the benefit of my husband. He's been in alcohol production. He's done manufacturing. He understands that space and we have local facilities in which we can produce on. So we started with a really boutique, small batch, like 550 bottles per batch place. And we positioned it that way. And so instead of saying like, okay, we have a hundred thousand dollar instead of saying we have a hundred thousand units and we're going to go to market and we're going to get in all of these retail chains and we're going to push 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 on e-commerce and try to sell out as fast as possible because we're working with a co-packing facility and like time is of the essence we just started like you know with jeremy making it by hand hand bottling and hand labeling, and I was a part of that process too, is that we're literally like crafting it from the bottom up. So you order the bottles, you have the label designed, you get the labels printed. There is like a label applicator that we roll the bottles through, but it's it's essentially a blending process that we take all of the ingredients. It's a couple days. It takes us to blend, put everything together, and then we fill bottles, cork them, package them, and that, and then they're done. So that's our process, which is really simple. It's very boutique. It's very craft. It's very small. Now, eventually that will continue to scale and that will change, but that's how a bottle is made now in the environment that we have. And we're going to continue to have a small, you know, wholesale or uh, we'll continue to have a small manufacturing, small distribution center, and we can go up to $700,000 in sales within that space before we think about moving to a co-packing facility. Or if, if it's right, you know, based on our ability to produce and the fact that we do have this manufacturing development background, it might make 
it might make sense for us financially not to outsource to a co-packer because there's a lot of financial investment there to be able to pay and support that while also thinking about what are the things that can go wrong. I was also having another conversation with another CPG brand where they have issues with their product sometimes. And then you either have to completely scrap the product and restart or the issue, like something happened with canning or something happened with this. And so there are issues that can come up if you don't control that environment. So yeah, so that's us and our bottle. So fascinating. Like I always think sometimes about like creating a physical product and it overwhelms me. So I'm super impressed <laughs> that you have the ability to think through and, and do those things. It's it's so fascinating. Um, and I'd love to know, so you, you know, you sold $25,000 in the first year, you've had a, gone to events and been featured places and, and all of that. What sales and marketing strategies have you implemented that like led to those sales? Like how did you sell the bottles that you've sold so far? Yeah. So I will say, you know, to comment on the physical product aspect, like it's not for the faint of heart because it is so many layers and so many pieces. Like, you know, for us, we really started with the brand, which is the layering of the website, our logo, uh, label design cards, like all of those things. But then you have to think about how am I going to get this to the person? So that's boxes, it's packaging, it's thank you cards, it's printing labels, you know, wh what what shipping are you going to use in order to distribute? And then all of the other pieces along the way, customer service, et cetera. So there are a lot of layers to think about when it comes to a physical product business. And it's not for everyone. I will say that having started one so far. I'm excited about the future still, but Service-based businesses are so much easier in that regard when it comes to the stuff. So for us, when it comes to marketing, one huge piece that, that plays off of what I was just saying is like we invested in the brand first. Before we had a product, we sold the product. So if you've ever heard of an MVP, minimum viable product, or even just before that is like monetize before you make it. So you create the thing in theoreticals. So you say, this is what we're producing, or this is what we're making, or this is the program we're running, or this is the product we're developing. Would you like to pre-purchase it. And so you sell in advance the thing that you're looking to develop. So we did that. So we knew that there was even just like a small market, small niche market that we were able to tap into and we had already made money before we had the product in hand. So that was really a benefit to us. And then that brand creation came along with that. So what we talk about on this podcast when it comes to developing a brand, how you want people to talk about you, the identity that it has, it's so much more than color palette, typography, and brand voice. It's just like, it's the way that you show up. It's the events that you take part in. It's the businesses that we approached in the restaurants that we were launched in. It's how I dress at events. It's how I speak about the product. It's all of the ways in which we show up, social media, website, and everything. So leveraging that brand has been one of the best marketing tactics we've been able to utilize because that means that people are attracted to us. So opportunities come to us. People want to be a part of our story. They want to be a part of the brand. They want to have us feel featured. And so I think it's so important to really think about and curate your brand in that way so that there is magnetism. That being said, I do a lot of outreach. I do a lot of networking events. We're in a small community. So for us, starting with in-person events and smaller things is positive. We don't live in LA. We don't live in San Francisco. We don't live in New York or Chicago or these big places that could probably break into the market quicker by doing larger scale events. But for us, being in a small community does help because we're able to kind of do a lot of different things, even though they're on a smaller scale. So networking, connecting, talking about what we do, sharing the brand and getting people interested in us has been huge because that has put us in events that we didn't anticipate being so successful. And a lot of those, again, are aligned with our brand identity. So we say no to things that aren't a good brand fit. So that's the starting place. But then, but I have put time into outreach. So not only networking and connecting with people for opportunities, but pitching us, going on places like Haro, going on places like quoted. We've talked about public relations. We have a great episode on public relations. So go back and listen to that if you're curious about how to break into getting featured in the press, in the media, or even just with backlinks online to substantiate your website. So 
that effort has been putting us out there and figuring out what's trending, what's niche to the sober curious market, what's important, and then pitching those ideas, bringing those contents to content, blah, blah, bringing those content topics to light, talking about them, and not being afraid to put us out there. So we have predominantly been on Instagram. We've done a little bit of TikTok. Social media hasn't been great in terms of driving sales. Email marketing drives sales. Direct to consumer, like in market, sell does sales well, and then really good like referrals, whether that's affiliates or public relations when it comes to press and publications. That's been the predominant amount of like driving sales so far. We are starting to run ads, so we'll see what that does. And then we're going to continue to kind of trial and error. But those have been the things that have really worked for us. Some of the things that I love about what you shared is first is about like staying local. I think some people underestimate how much success you can have by serving a smaller area. You know, that you have this idea that you have to be national, you have to be huge to make a lot of money. when Yes, it's a great idea to be national. That's fantastic. But you can always start small and you could build you could build a completely sustainable business that only serves your county. That is a real thing that people can do, you know, when you're starting a business. And we have this idea. And I think probably because of social media and like seeing so many businesses, we have this idea that you have to be like national to be successful. And that's just not true. You know, you can be a local business and make a lot of money and be very successful. And sometimes that can be a really sustainable way to grow from experience. I've seen businesses taking investment. You should not take investment from someone lightly. When you when you take when you take investment, you can lose control. And I've seen companies lose their essence when they take investment and it completely changed the business model, completely changed the culture. You might need that investment to go national right away, but you might be able to be choosier about the investment you take along the way if you grow slower and and kind of grow from the ground up. So it's just something to think about when you're thinking about your business strategy. There is no one size fits all approach. You can start local. You could start with one thing. And and when you if you try to go too big, there are potential downsides to that. Right. And and starting small and starting with your local community is, I think, really, really smart with a with a brand like this, because, you know, there are some brands that take off and go national, but because they started small, they feel homegrown, even though they're national. Right. I can't think of one off the top of my head, but this is something that, you know, happens with companies. You kind of picture them as a small local thing forever because that's where their their heart is. And that can actually be a selling point. The other thing that I, you bring up that I think is really good to note here is that I think some people, when they start a business, they think build a website, post on social media, the sales will come. And and the truth is website CEO takes time. That's a long game. Social media, unless you get like a unique viral moment, that's also a long game. You know what I mean? That's that's the long game. If you are serious about growing a business, partnerships, networking, run in the streets, talking to people, like that's going to be how you you make sales, you know? And the long game, yes, the long game, you need social, having automated sales coming in, but you'll you'll likely get your first dollar from a handshake deal and and not from someone buying your thing online from finding your social post. And so really when you're thinking about your marketing strategy for your business, realizing that something a little bit more hands-on is likely what your business needs to get started and, and make that initial sale. We forget the word of mouth is actually still the number one sales channel for most brands and businesses. Like it's it's actually not paid marketing. It's actually not social media. It's word of mouth because people talk about things. And that could be people talking about you in social media, or it could be talking people talking about you in an ad like TikTok shop. But other people spreading and sharing your product is such a huge, huge impact when it comes to sales. And so we have launched our referral loyalty and an ambassador like affiliate programs. And so we'll continue to scale those over time. And as we launch on TikTok shop, getting with the right influencers to run the ads, to talk about the product. But you also want to figure out how can you do that organically? How can be you be unique and experimental and getting people to talk about you? And whether that is, again, networking in person and meeting people and starting that way, or whether that is in the online space, like don't think you have to do it alone. Don't think you have to do it in isolation. And 
and don't think that you just have to like, I just got to keep going on this one channel because everyone says it's going to work. No, like you got to find other alternatives and find another path. I want to switch gears a little bit in our conversation to talk about the life side of being an entrepreneur. Now, both you and your husband, you're both entrepreneurs. You started this company together. That can probably be a blessing. Also cause some challenges being with this person day in, day out, 24 seven, running a business together. Talk to me about that. How, how do you be running a business together? All of that, balancing that and a relationship and your household all together. We spent years Definitely trial and error. I will say I have empathy for anyone who does work with their partner in any capacity because it can be very challenging and you have to work on it and work through it. And there has to be communication and there are going to be times that are not so great and there are going to be times that are a lot better. So for us, we have both been in like business ownership for many years now. My husband started his first company over 10 years ago and then had left that company and transitioned to a new company that he's with now. And then we've also launched a brand before this, a corporation, didn't work out so well. There's, when you start learning about entrepreneurs' stories, you'll usually find they're like 10, at least 10 businesses into what it is that is successful for them. You're, you happen to be like one of the unicorn magical people who like start a business. And it, this is my third business. So most people start opportunities, whether that's a side hustle here or an idea here, or let me just start this Facebook page and start getting interest. Like we've bounced around from a lot of things and we've definitely learned through the first business, some of the communication things that did not work out super well. And even in the past year, we've had some struggles because I tend to be a very like dominant communicator and have more of like a male driven way of communicating, which is very direct to the point. I don't really tread on emotions or like deal with it that way. I'm like, no, this is what needs to happen. And well, what about this? And I don't like to beat around the bush. And that's more difficult for my husband, not to say that he can't handle that in other capacities, but from his partner, his wife, that can be challenging, right? We're most sensitive and most vulnerable to the criticism, the language, the tone of the person that we're closest to. So we have to be very conscious of that. So I would say in the beginning, especially of TBH, we had some more of those difficulties of communication failure. I would say like, because you live with the person, because you're close to the person, you start talking about business all the time and you have to curb that. So that's something that we've had to learn is like, we don't talk about business in bed because I would get into bed and be like, here's all my thoughts, you know, from the day or whatever the situation was, or we're eating dinner and we're talking about it, or we're going on our walk and we're talking about it. So we had to start setting boundaries of when we specifically talked about business, whether that was a designated meeting or designated time. Or asking the other person, hey, I have some thoughts about this. Is this a good time for you to chat? And just getting that permission instead of just diving right into it. And then figuring out the communication style. So for me, I've had to soften the way that I communicate, take things in more like, you know, feminine stride of presenting an idea. Perhaps if you've ever read How to Win Friends and Influence People, that I think is a more like negotiable way of communicating that's not as brash and it is positive in lots of different relationships and lots of different work environments. Taking more of that approach of like suggesting things, asking questions instead of like direct communication, this is what I need, which also, I mean, like, isn't that positive anyway? I've had to learn about my tone. This is a total personal thing too. Apparently I have a very condescending tone, even if I don't mean it. So I've had to pull back on that and learn ways to communicate and then also better understand like what are my strengths and what are his strengths. And I really believe in this from a team perspective as well, from a leadership perspective. I love Gallup Strengths Finder. I think we've talked about it a little bit on the cast. Ooh, we should do a whole episode on it because it's so genius. Each individual person should learn and know their strengths and be able to fill into those. It's like the zone of genius, the zone of excellence, the zone of competence, the zone of incompetence. Similarly, is figuring out what are you particularly good at and how can you work best? How can you show up with high performance because you love what you do, you get what you do, and you want to do the best at it, you know? Knowing my strengths, knowing his strengths, and being able to either help or support each other where we're weak or being able to fulfill our roles properly, that's been a big part of it as well. So it's taken some time. I think that we're in a positive place now, and it'll be interesting to see how we expand and grow when things become, you know, higher stakes, bigger pressure, bigger dollars invested, and like things at play. So it'll be interesting to see how things evolve. But I think that we're at a 
healthy place right now. And we're going to continue to execute on communication, you know, setting the boundaries and really understanding like how we each perform best. And I feel like those things, those three things have really helped and supported us to this point. A lot of what you said too, I think also relates to making sure you're treating your business like a business setting, like some of those things help with like the relationship side, right? Making sure you have time for your relationship. But when you say we're going to have designated meetings, you could easily start a business with a partner, a spouse, a friend, and it just seeps into your friendship, but then you don't actually have business time. So saying, okay, we're going to talk about that thing on this day, instead of just talking about it a little here and there and never actually, actually taking action. So as an entrepreneur, especially if you have multiple things going on, or you're starting a business with a friend, a, a spouse, a partner, really finding ways to treat it like it is it is a business and really make decisions and, and, and learn how to kind of separate a little bit. Like we're having a business meeting now and now I'm having bus- dinner with my husband. And those are two different activities and that'll like help you both in your life and in your business. I think structure honestly is so important and I got I got into business just kind of haphazardly and I was kind of do this here and I would kind of do that there and I was kind of selling this thing and I was kind of it just like it was all super wishy-washy and so now I have so much more intention around what is the structure? When are we meeting? When is this due? Like thinking about things a lot differently that definitely changes the game and seeing it as a business and I feel like you know even if you're not looking for funding doing activities like creating a Doing activities like creating a business plan, doing projections of expenses and income, thinking about what your strategies are, whether you follow something like the EOS model or whether you put together a pitch deck as if you were going to find investors, but you're really like it's it's caused me to ask questions that are very valuable and important for me to know as the founder. And so it's not just for other people, it's for you to understand what is that vision? What is that strategy? How am I going to execute on a consistent basis to be able to meet the goals that I'm working toward? Like it's it's all really important. Doing those exercises instead of feeling like, well, I don't know what I'm doing today or I had this goal for the quarter, but I didn't hit it. Okay, what now? Like it, it can really help clarify a lot of those things that feel confusing or frustrating when you don't have the structure. Bring up so many good points. I feel like we could talk about this for hours and hours and hours. I'd love to know, you know, on a personal level for you, you've, you know, with TBH, with all of your businesses, all of the things that you've accomplished and done as an entrepreneur, all of the failures or missteps or things that have gotten. What is that core thing that motivates you? Like, how do you keep going? How do you get up every day, motivate yourself to accomplish the things you need to accomplish? I ask myself this question all the time, and I will say it's probably changed a little bit over the years. If anything now, like I can say that I've probably been like solidly in business for the past six to eight ish years. Again, starting like haphazardly, not really officially. And then there have been different seasons of focus where I've been making more money and doing more like effective things and having more structure and having more substance to what I was doing. And the funny thing is, is like I, I, I'm at this point where, you know, you and I have talked about Joanna, but I don't feel like financially I'm anywhere close to where I want to be. But I have this like really foundational understanding and sense of self. Like I really love business. Like I love business strategy. I love talking about marketing. I love brand. I love, you know, the idea of helping people in a way that I'm in control of because we're going to do an episode on why you should or shouldn't start a business. And one of the things that came to mind for me as a little sneak peek is that You shouldn't go into business just to help or serve people because you can do that in so many other capacities, but you're doing it in a way that you control and that what you, the way that you design. So the way that you envision, the way that you see into the future, the way that you can directly be navigating, choosing. And I think for me, the deeper level of why has to do with freedom. I think for the majority of entrepreneurs, it comes down to freedom whether that's time freedom, financial freedom, like schedule, lifestyle, freedom of choice. Again, when you say like, I'm focusing on this product, I'm doing this service, I want to run my customer service this way. You can have that freedom of choice in a really big way. And 
ultimately, like, I don't think I would be good at anything else. Like, I don't think I'd be a good employee. I mean, I think I was a high performer when I was an employee, but I never lasted very long. Like, I was never very successful at just continuing to do the same thing. And when you talk about strengths and you when you talk about what you're uniquely qualified for, and we've talked about the visionary, the integrator, we've talked about Strengths Finder, we've talked about all of these things on the podcast and these different concepts of how we show up in our lives and what you're, we're uniquely qualified to do is like, truly, I just don't think that I'm an employee. Like, I don't do super well when people give me things to do. I don't do really well with co- like repetitive tasks and consistent things. I don't do well when I have a structure and I have to show up on a consistent, regular basis. I thrive when I have to push myself to do the things. And for whatever reason, I can work a 14-hour day. I can get in front of the computer and I can do the tasks and activities. And some people would call it discipline, but I don't think it's discipline. I think it is just this like inherent motivation and focus that for whatever reason, this is what I'm meant to be doing. And I ask these questions of myself, like what is that inherent thing? I don't think I've nailed it quite yet, but there is some sort of larger purpose that I have to like mentorship, leadership, inspiration. And those are the things that I feel like keep coming up for me. And we were just talking about before we got recording about public speaking. And I really believe that I have an ability to speak publicly in a way that positively impacts people. And that's what I want to do. And that's what I'm here to do. And so I think it's this balance of like purpose, desire of freedom, and just like this inherent underlying motivation to just continue to show up because you've decided that this is the thing that I'm doing and it doesn't matter how it manifests or in what way it manifests and I'm not tied to the outcome anymore or what it is that it's going to look like, but I'm here and this is what I love to do and this is my purpose and this is my passion and that's why. Thank you for sharing that. And it just goes to show how much like everything's a journey, right? You're living this life you're having this motivation and you're still figuring it out and you're creating the life that's right for you, the business that's right for you. And there's really no right or wrong way to do that. Right. And that's really what we in in this podcast want to cultivate this idea that as a woman, you can build the life, build the business that you want, that gives you that freedom, right. That gives you that freedom to, to live the life that's right for you. And for some people, and for every person that's going to look different. So thank you so much for letting me interview you today. I really liked getting, I know I've heard a lot about um, TBH and what you're doing, but I feel like I really got the whole story and the whole picture much more clearly today. Um, We will leave uh, your website, uh, your Instagram handle for TBH in the show notes so that people can go check it out. And if living a sober curious lifestyle, something that you want to learn more about, definitely go check check it out. Thanks so much. Thanks for tuning in. Find the link in the show notes to join us in our free Facebook group to discuss the podcast, ask questions of our guest experts, and network with a group of female entrepreneurs who value collaboration over competition. Please subscribe, share, leave a review, and be sure to catch our next episode. What is one thing you can do today to prioritize you in business and life?